the cover story, Professor of Business Ethics at NYU's Stern School of Business, mm. Professor Jonathan Hay. Professor, good to see you. Nice to be here. So we'll put Donald Trump to the side for a minute because you're talking more specifically, you're zeroing in on political correctness and higher education. Let's lay out a couple of things you're talking about, some buzzwords we've heard lately. Trigger warnings, microaggressions. Mm -hmm. That's right. These words, nobody even mentioned these words three or four years ago. If you do a Google search on them, you, you graph out. Just the last two or three years, there's been a sea change in the political atmosphere on a lot of schools. So many students are now asking for warnings on any sort of book which is assigned. What if it has violence against women in it? Well, what if a woman reads that who was raped? We can't just have her read that. So you, they're asking for a warning on any book that has anything offensive. Um, there's a concept of microaggressions that you might ask an innocent question. Uh, according to one campus guideline, if you say, I think the most qualified person should get the job. Well, that could be a microaggression. You might be saying that people who didn't get the job aren't qualified. I, we're, I mean, you're just making me so tired right now. Do these conversations really happen? They do. And that's what's interesting to me is that this what might seem like it's a left-right issue. Yeah. But actually, you know, almost most professors... And they're sick of this stuff. They're horrified by this stuff. So it's so everybody uh, over about 25 seems to think this is ridiculous. If the professors are horrified, who's imposing these things on yeah, the schools? Yeah, what, what? It, well, it's coming from the students. That's what's so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, this is a generation of students that was raised in fundamentally different ways. Child rearing changed in the 80s. So most of us are old enough to remember that uh, there was the Aton Pate disappearance in 1979. Uh, there were the warnings on milk cartons. Kid, parents got much more protective in the 80s and 90s. Zero tolerance policies on bullying. And so by the time these students get to college, they expect that adults are going to protect them. And if I feel offended, some adult must have been, should have been there to protect me. So John, uh, having taught on college campuses for over 10 years, uh, I experienced some of this. And it seems like to me two things are happening simultaneously. That there is what you describe as this greater attention to microaggressions, trigger warnings. At the same time, though, on anonymous social media sites, there is a proliferation of people saying whatever they want to want to say that is politically incorrect, so to speak. Um, what's the line right. that should be drawn? What is the appropriate line I mean, that's the question, for college right? campuses? Yeah. Well, that, that's right. This really should be an exercise in balance. And this is why free speech cases are always difficult, because there are things on both sides. So I think one clear line is that while we have freedom of speech in this country, if someone says something that's offensive, of course people should be able to call him out, people should be able to criticize. You know, Donald Trump says a lot of offensive things. People should criticize him. But if you have a legal right to call in for adult reinforcement and punishment on a college campus, that's really chilling. And so many colleges have speech codes. They're all illegal. And my co-author, Greg Lukianoff, runs the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. They sue the colleges. They always win. So you can't start criminalizing speech unless it's threatening. That's one line. Um, it's, it should be an exercise in balance. And we've lost the sense of balance. Uh, Caddy Kay has a question from Washington. Caddy. Jonathan, do you think this is a kind of pendulum issue, one of those things that has swung too far one way and will naturally correct itself? Or do you think that this is actually going to have significant long-term damaging impact on the quality of American higher education? Mm -hmm. um, well, we, it's hard to predict the future, but I would put all of my money on that it being a long-term uh, problem, and here's why. The conditions of childhood change so much, and they're not changing back. It's not as though, oh, parents are suddenly going to get really permissive, and kids go out and play after school, ride your bicycles around, I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know, want to know what you're doing in the afternoons. That's not going to come back. So we're going to have coddled childhoods from here on out. Hmm. Another contributing hmm. problem Problem is the rising polarization, the political polarization. Left and right used to only slightly dislike each other, if you go back to the 1970s. Now they intensely dislike each other, now that the parties are perfectly sorted. Interesting. So as the political polarization gets more hostile, any environment which leans left or right is going to get more of an intense breeding ground for hostility. Is, is there any way that a parent with a thimble of common sense could get a list of colleges where they employ trigger warnings, microaggression, and speech codes so they could save themselves money on application uh, fees to those yeah. colleges. Yeah. So that's, you know, a I, thimble. Uh, you know, just, I, a, I, just an ounce of yeah. common sense. Okay, I think you, you, you've just laid out a, a, a great opportunity for some conservative magazine or something. I, maybe there is. I, conservative? I don't know. What about one. just a common sense magazine? There you, well, I wish there were centrist magazines and common sense magazines. I, maybe you can start one. But yeah, that, that seems like that's needed. You, 
you touched briefly on this ideological question. Another troubling thing to a lot of people is that you have speakers, largely conservative speakers, who are hired to come to campuses and then have those invitations revoked. Or when they do come, the schools create these safe rooms exactly. where oh students my God. can go so yeah. they don't have to hear ideas that counter their personal philosophies. Is that an absurd position for a university to take? It is, and this is why, the, so these are always driven by the students. The faculty and the administrators are usually opposed to these efforts. So, for example, Condoleezza Rice, there was big protests when she was invited to be the commencement speaker at Rutgers. Okay, now, I can understand, you know, the tensions about the Iraq war are very high. So there I could even understand students protesting. But Christine Lagarde being disinvited or protested from Smith, one of the most powerful women in the world, being disinvited because... At a women's college. Yeah, because some students think, you know, her policies were bad for developing... I mean, if it gets to that level where if you don't like anything they did, they're out. And this gets to the, really the central point of our article. My co-author, Greg, he had this great insight, which is that he was learning to do cognitive behavioral therapy for his own depression, where you learn these weird distortions that people do. And, um, uh, and what he saw was that, wow, all these things happening on campuses, they're teaching students to think in distorted ways. Mm. So yeah, it's absurd, and ultimately it's bad for the students. The September issue of The Atlantic is online now. This is fascinating. The magazine hits news.